All right, if we can go ahead and start in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. This is a reading from Romans 12, uh, verses uh, 4 through 8. For as in one body we have many parts, and all of the parts do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually parts of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them. If prophecy in proportion to the faith, if ministry in ministering, if one is a teacher, then in teaching, and when it, if one exhorts in exhortation, if one contributes in generosity, if one is over others with diligence, and if one does acts of mercy, then do so with cheerfulness. And Lord, we thank you so much that you know our hearts, that you have created so intimately and so perfectly, that you have created to love with a vocation of love, and that you know who we are and how you have best made us to love you. We ask that you will reveal and open up different parts of our heart that you want access to this afternoon and that you will show us the best way that we can relate and communicate with you and that we can receive. Lord, we ask that you will just send your Holy Spirit upon us in this room and that the Holy Spirit will animate the beating of our hearts to teach us how to love with your love. And we ask that the Blessed Mother, who was the perfect Christian, who knew you better than any person on earth who bore you within her, who experienced and received a love, who gave a love to you that is unique, but the one that she desires for us to share in as well, that she will pray with us, that she will intercede for us this afternoon as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So um, I'm excited about um, this workshop, because I think it's kind of fun. It's a little bit uh, different, and um, I've done it before. And have just been really excited about some of the fruits that have come out, especially of conversation afterwards. So hopefully um, there will be something that the Lord will have to offer to you. Um, first, I wanted to give a, a little bit of an analogy, a little example, kind of what we're going to uh, be talking about. And I have um, four small children at home. And uh, well, my oldest is 11. And then I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, all girls. And then uh, last summer, we had a baby boy, baby Colby. And so he will never make an important decision in his life. I'm sure he'll have all kinds of people telling him exactly what he should be doing at all times. So, um, but my second child, Claire, um, she is very strong-willed. They all are in their own way, but she, um, she has a very special gift of strong-willedness. <laughs> so um, she is also the pickiest eater that I've ever met in my entire life. So we joke that Claire is a vegetarian that doesn't eat vegetables. So if she could survive on oxygen, cake, and tomato soup, that would probably be her preference. <laughs> so um, one evening uh, we were at dinner and every night we sit down and she's like, why do you always make such gross things for dinner? And so we're trying so hard to coax her through eating her food. Um, and so my older daughter, Maria, she came up with this great idea telling Claire that if she ate her beans, then she would be able to fly. And so Claire is a very trusting individual, apparently. It's like not even on my radar. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, so Claire, uh, she, she's giving her all these bites of beans and we didn't know Claire really thought she was going to fly after dinner was over. And so afterwards, she was very angry. <laughs> she was very, very, very upset afterwards. She was literally like standing on the couch trying to jump off, like, it's got to work. I'm going to will it to work. Um, so I was thinking about um, this, and then kind of what I was saying in our um, description of this workshop is that sometimes I think that there can be um, this temptation for us, um, I think especially as adults, uh, who are immersed, you know, in and different things like this, too, that uh, are active in our parishes, and we know a lot of really holy people, to think like that there is this formula for holiness. Like, if I do this, if I do this one thing, um, then it's going to work. You know, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experience God in this way. It's going to uh, heal these things in my life, whatever. That there's this formula. If I do everything right, then I am going to be holy, and it's going to be fine. And then sometimes when it doesn't really work out the way we expect, we're kind of upset about that. You know, like, I thought that I was going to go to this conference, and I 
I was going to leave and all of these things were going to manifest in me and whatever. Um, but what I think that is really beautiful about a topic like this, about kind of looking inward and looking at our heart and how um, the Lord has created us is to really have this understanding that God is going to work in our lives and in our hearts in a very unique and a singular way, in a way that he's not going to do for other people. And sometimes it's going to manifest itself um, in ways that we expect. And sometimes it's going to manifest itself in ways that we absolutely don't expect at all. So when I uh, was in high school, um, and I was super, super involved in uh, my youth group, and I was kind of known as like this leader within our church. Well, then I came to school here. <laughs> and so my identity really was, you know, with my group of friends, was uh, that I was kind of leading the charge and like inviting people to stuff and things like that. And all of a sudden, I arrive at uh, Franciscan University, and there's people who like gave up their shoes for Lent in Ohio in the winter, and like gave up their bed. And I'm like, I gave up complaining about the cafeteria food and I can't even do that. So I kind of had this identity crisis. Like, what, what am I doing? Like, who am I? I thought that, you know, I, I had this kind of holiness thing worked out and all of a sudden I'm surrounded by all these people who have it worked out a lot more than I do. So uh, my best friend, uh, when I was at school here, and we kind of went through something um, similar and uh, we're both very similar personalities, uh, like a little bit uh, extroverted, um, louder. And she, she went through this period of time where, uh, I would, we would be hanging out and she was like really quiet and reserved. And she was spending all of this time, like in the library. And I was like, we don't do that. We don't go to the library. What are you doing? What are you doing? And, uh, and for like a couple of weeks, this was going on and we would invite her to go and do stuff. And she, she wouldn't come and she would stay at home. So finally I called her out. I'm like, what is going on? What is your problem? And she said that she, you know, had, had been really like reflecting on the Blessed Mother and how she was pretty sure like the Blessed Mother never was like loud and like yelling and like laughing really like inappropriately loud at jokes you know like she would do sometimes and stuff and and she was like I just want to be holy so badly I want holiness so much but I I don't see I don't see this like as as a part of how what holiness seems to look like you know and we're talking about this and and really becoming convicted like your holiness for you is not going to look like it, it does for monks, right, who um, aren't allowed to speak or whatever that is, that we really have to start looking and discerning deep within our own hearts about what holiness looks like for us. And so that's basically what we're going to be talking about um, this afternoon is about the fact that, you know what, the world has already had um, St. Maximilian Kolbe, and the world has already had St. Therese, and has already had all of these giants of our faith, right? But the, what the world has never had before is you. And that one of my favorite verses uh, from Esther, Mary was talking about this earlier and brought it up kind of as a, as a call and a rally for this weekend is that perhaps we were created for just a time as this, that the Lord has created you specifically, your gifts, your heart, your way of encountering him and the people who are in your life and who need to have the Lord introduced to them in their life and that he has placed you specifically within their lives. That, that the world has had all of these other great saints before, but what we have never had is you. And this is what all of the saints had discovered within their own lives and what they did and what they did well was that they weren't trying to live the exact life pattern of somebody else, but what they were doing was constantly listening to the Spirit, constantly looking and searching and being open to exactly what it was that God was calling them to do in the way that he wanted to speak in them and wanted to speak through them. And so as, we, as we're here on this, this eve of Pentecost, I think that this is a really great um, image and a really great place for us to start of really inviting that Holy Spirit to come and to ignite within us. Because what I think is really unique, and I don't think really talked about that much when we think about the story of the Pentecost, is that there was 12 different men who were in that upper room, plus the Blessed Mother, right? And that the Holy Spirit came and descended on this room. And, and here are these, these people who were kind of lost, right? Like they, they lost the Lord um, in his death, and then he was back in his resurrection. And then here he is, and he's, he's left them again. And so their response is that they go back into hiding, and they're trying to figure out, you know, what, 
what do we do? What do we do? We don't know where to go. We don't know what we're called to do. The Lord said he's going to give us this mission to go out to the whole world and bring the gospel, baptizing everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're 12 guys. We don't have our leader. Uh, what are we going to do, right? But that Jesus had promised that he was going to send this paraclete, that he was going to send the Holy Spirit. And when he did so, and the apostles went bursting forth out of the upper room, that they went out into their community, and it wasn't one of them. It didn't just happen to Peter, and Peter went out and was able to, to preach. It didn't just happen to John, but that it took 12 different voices, 12 people who went out with their own voice and were proclaiming the word of God, right? And were telling people in their own fashion with what the Holy Spirit was doing in them, in their own way, and that that was what touched the hearts and the lives of so many people. And their response to the Spirit being welled up within them it changed everything about their lives, that they were completely transformed. They went from being these people who were afraid and who were hiding in this upper room to these people who were out and who were not, who were fearless, who were risking their lives going out and preaching Jesus. It changed everything about their lives, but it also changed the lives of 3,000 people who were there that day, that the scripture says that 3,000 people who would have never known Jesus Christ 3,000 people who would have never had the Spirit come in their lives, who would have never been baptized, that they came to join the Christian church, that they were baptized that day. It changed everything for them, the entire course of their lives, because they were willing to accept the Spirit in the way that God wanted for these 12 men to live. And really, we are only sitting here in this exact seat where you are sitting because 12 men did it, right? because the Spirit came upon them, because they listened and they acted and they heard and they went out into the world. And all of these thousands of years later, here we are, because they heard and they did what God wanted them to do within their own lives and within their own hearts. And as we read through the New Testament and we read kind of this tension that there is between Peter and St. Paul and like the followers of Peter and the followers of St. Paul, and they had very different methods of going out and preaching Jesus um, into, into the corners of the world. But that, that's exactly what some people needed. <laughs> some people needed to hear Paul, and they needed to hear the way that Paul would describe things, and the passion with which he spoke, and the way in which he shared things. And some people needed Peter. And in my time, um, I was a youth minister for many years, and I worked um, always with, there was more than one person on staff um, in our youth ministry office, and always with people who were very different than I was. And there was teenagers that I could connect with. There are young men, young women who um, I, I was able to speak to, and there was people that, that I had no chance. <laughs> there was no way that they were going to relate to me. Um, there was no way that they were going to be able to really understand and have their hearts touched in the same way that somebody else was able to do that and was able to share Jesus. And I was so thankful always for that. And so what our desire and our purpose really he is here for us this afternoon is to discover specifically what our tongue of fire is that it's not gonna look exactly like somebody else's. It's not gonna be this formula. If I do this, then this is going to happen and I'm going to be holy and things are gonna look like everybody else. But where is it that God is calling me? What is my tongue of fire? Where am I going to be able to reach deep within? So uh, we're gonna talk about a couple of different um, specific spirituality types. Um, if you're uh, here, I don't think we have any. So one time I was giving this talk um, and there were some sisters in the room and I was like, uh-oh, this is a lot of pressure because you might've joined the wrong spirituality type and now you're stuck for life. <laughs> so uh, I don't think there's any here before right now though. We're gonna talk about um, a couple different spirituality types and there's hundreds of these. So these are not something that like you're necessarily gonna be boxed into. Um, there's some that are listed on your sheet. We're gonna talk a little bit um, more about them in a minute, uh, not quite yet. But if you wanted to look later on, if you felt like um, none of these really, I'm not quite sure you know, where, I, where I fit in, there's a link at the bottom of the sheet if you wanna use your phone even, and you could take like a little quiz and it'll tell you um, where you fit in. Um, but when we talk about um, spiritualities, when we talk about ways of praying, ways of encountering God, what we're not going to be talking about right now is like the obvious things that all of us need to do, mass, the rosary, um, praying the scriptures, things like that. What we're talking about specifically is what are the ways that when you pray and the ways that you search to encounter God, that it really makes your heart come alive 
the things that really resonate really, really deep within you. And so something that would be similar, um, I think, is um, like the concept of the love languages. So love languages are usually um, in like a couple, uh, in a, a married couple or a dating couple. Usually this is where this kind of a topic would come up. Um, and it has been very useful for my husband and I to be able to understand. Uh, but basically what it is, is it's saying that there's um, five different ways that we really express and that we receive love um, from one another. Let's see, I can always name four of them. <laughs> so let's see if I can get all five. Um, physical touch, uh, words from affirmation, acts of service, quality time, and gifts. So those are, uh, generally speaking, the ways that we show people our affection and that we experience affection. So for all of us, though, there's one of those that really, really hits home. Like, that's when I really understand your love and your affection for me. Unfortunately for my husband and I, my very last one is his first one and vice versa. So for him, he really loves acts of service. He loves doing acts of service, um, doing kind things for me um, to show me his love. He really appreciates when I um, do kind things for him, and that's when he really um, knows my love for him. For me, I have words of affirmation. Words of affirmation all day long. Every, like, all the time. I'm like, tell me why you love me. He's like, ah! Like, we've been married for 15 years! You don't know yet! You know? And so then he'll say stuff. I'm like, I already know those. He's like, oh my gosh. How many times? How many new things do I have to come up with? So, um, so you know, it's it's a battle. <laughs> so he can, But he'll wash my car, and, you know, that's his way of showing me. I'm like, thank you. So now give me a compliment. So, um, but <laughs> so it's good for us to know though, like he's, so then I understand when he's doing this, that he's showing me his love, right? And for me to also know how to love him best. So um, that's what I really kind of like about this topic about our spirituality is that God is gonna speak to us. He made our hearts, right? And he knows exactly how we're gonna best understand his love. We are best going to receive him. And he wants to pour himself out to us in that kind of a way. And so sometimes for us, like we have to be a open and willing to like go down these different paths and um, discover maybe new things that are not um, natural, that are maybe not something that everybody else is doing in ways for us to be able to open ourselves up to the way that God is trying to pour himself out, um, out to us. Because really, obviously, that's what it's all about. It's really all about love. It's all about the Lord wanting to bestow his love upon us and for us to be able to know how we can show our love best to the Lord as well. Because when we pour ourselves out to the Lord, then that's when we are changed as well. And so um, on your handout, what you have is four different um, examples. Again, there's hundreds of these. These were four that I liked that I thought kind of um, covered a lot of ground. Um, so we're just going to look at these um, kind of quickly. So the first of these is the path of intellect. Um, and the path of intellect is um, most commonly known as like a Thomistic prayer um, type of way. Um, it's very neat and orderly. And the key word when you talk about a Thomistic um, type of a prayer, the path of intellect, is true. Truth, that encountering truth, that this is something that resonates really deeply within you, um, that you love uh, theology, that you probably should have been at defending the faith instead of power and purpose. Maybe you came to the wrong conference. I don't know. <laughs> but that you really, really love, um, you know, the, the things of your mind, right? And, and searching to know God deeply in this kind of a way. Um, Second is uh, the path of devotion. Um, This one is more of a St. Augustinian prayer. Um, This is really looking for finding deep meaning in things um, and really being driven by the movement of the heart. That the movement of the heart is really what will thrust you um, into your relationship with other people. The movement of the heart will be what will thrust you into your relationship with God. So um, looking for meaning. Um, and then next uh, is the path of service, um, which is a very Franciscan, obvious, um, obviously, type of uh, prayer. This is where we really encounter God through the movement of our spirit, um, which will call us into action. And so this is when we experience God um, through our senses, um, but also that that experience will really propel us forward into, um, into service, into doing things, into action. 
Um, and so then lastly, um, this Ignatian prayer, um, this is going to be very similar to the path of devotion where we're looking for these things that really move our hearts. But what an Ignatian type of a spirituality would really love to do is to take those movements of the heart and to really unpack them in a really systematic way, to look for, um, for the ways that these things will unfold into our lives um, and those deep meaning of things, how do those apply to the other portions of our lives? as well. And so um, what I think is really beautiful uh, about this as well is that um, of all of these different um, spiritualities, you know, there might be certain times where we look in our life and say, you know, when I, uh, maybe at, at a certain point in my life, I experienced um, the Lord in, in a more of a uh, Franciscan type of a way, but now I'm really loving like this Ignatian spirituality or things like that. Um, maybe at different states in our lives so that um, different things will come alive. And what I think is really beautiful about this is that there's probably a little bit of overlap into different kind of areas. And so just like I was saying um, earlier that, you know, there's there's these different giants that we've had in our faith that have really enveloped these types of a spirituality, but that let's say that you are somebody who really falls into this category of like a Franciscan type of a spirituality. What that doesn't mean is that you should go at home and sell all of your belongings, strip down naked and run into the woods, okay? Like St. Francis. It doesn't mean that we have to do everything exactly like him, but what it might mean is that we have this, this call and this love for service and this desire for action and going out, um, which might lead us into more of a Mother Teresa type of a spirituality spirituality, the way that we encounter um, the Lord in other people, which she learned from a cloistered nun, St. Therese, that she was the one that who inspired Mother Teresa in her way of, of doing all of these um, small things with great love, right? And so what we have to do is we have to look at where God is calling us um, and and find these ways kind of as a starting point of where our heart feels like it's coming alive. But then there also takes some discernment in how we are to put these things into action, practically speaking in our own prayer life and also in the way that we deal with other people. This is why St. Catherine of Siena, she could say, you know, if you are what you should be, then you will set the, wor the world on fire. What she doesn't say if, is if you're exactly like me, <laughs> then you will set the world on fire, right? And so what we have to do is we have to take this to prayer. We have to take this to the discernment of uh, the Holy Spirit and ask for really an encounter of how God is calling to us to stretch and to um, experience him in a new way. Um, I read this analogy um, on this topic that I really loved um, when it's thinking of uh, if you have a problem with your car and your car is not exactly working in the way that you think that it should be, and there's some kind of uh, dysfunction that's going on, the way to fix that is not for you to be a really good driver. <laughs> you can't be a better driver and to fix the things that are going on within your car. And so that's kind of the same type of thing um, that we're talking about here this afternoon is that if there's these areas that we feel like we're missing something within our own prayer life and within, within our um, relationship with God, then being a better, uh, better at going to Mass and better at um, at praying our rosary harder and all of those kind of things, like they're not going to fix our problem unless we're allowing the one who knows the car, who built the car, who built our hearts, who knows exactly how we're supposed to function, unless we're allowing him to come in and he's going to be the one that's going to work on our hearts. So we'll be able to see um, all of those um, types of our spirituality um, really come to life. Uh, the Catechism talks about this. It says, um, the spiritualities of the saints are in their rich diversity, refractions of the one pure life, light of the Holy Spirit. And so I like this image of, um, of a prison, of this refraction, of that we all do have the same Holy Spirit and that same opportunity, but the refraction and the colors and the ways that it's going to be seen, the ways that it's going to come out, are going to be very different in our own life. So um, the trick here is, though, as we're looking at all of these, 
um, is that we cannot compare our, these different spiritualities to one another and to say that one is better than the next. And I think that this sounds like that would be really obvious, but um, in the Catholic Church, I don't think it really is really obvious because if you ever read comments in blogs on any kind of um, thing that has to do with spirituality, you find some people who are very convicted that there is one way that we are supposed to be praying, one way that we're supposed to be encountering God, you know, things like that. And the beauty, I think one of the many beauties of the Catholic Church, but one of the many beauties is that we have so many different ways that we can express our faith, that we can encounter the Lord as long as they are all under that same umbrella, that they are all needed, that we really need all of these different types of spirituality in order for the church to be alive and to be moving and to be able to be breathing. And so our we, we think of ourselves as this body that's many parts. I also really love to use baseball analogies. I'm a really big baseball fan, go Astros. So um, when we think about like on a team, a team mentality, that the first baseman cannot spend all of this time really worried about what the left fielder is doing, right? The first baseman has to do his job. He has to be all in in what he is called to do. He has to be paying attention, um, and he can't be focusing on what's happening in left field. And the left fielder needs to be doing the exact same thing. He needs to be focused on what he's supposed to be doing. And if everybody is not um, focused on their job, then they can't function as a team. And there will be this great lacking in what um, what they are supposed to be doing and what their goal is, right? Um, and then um, also I think another temptation and something that um, can really happen, we were talking about this actually, um, some of us on the ministry team last night, is that oftentimes people can end up um, within their own spirituality where they feel called and become so enveloped in that as the end all be all that the other types of things that are really important kind of lose their meaning. So um, for example, if someone is really, really um, into this, this life of service, and I think we've all seen this within the church, is that if somebody gets really, really involved in um, social justice and they are so obsessed you know, with, with this calling and serving the poor and things like that. And then the temptation can be that the, this call of this path of the truth, searching for the truth, this intellectual path, well, that's not really quite as important as long as we're taking care of all of the poor. You know, or somebody who is so into um, a path of beauty and really focusing on all of those kind of things, as long as everybody's happy and everybody is, you know, comfortable where they are, we're experiencing all this goodness and this beauty, well, then we don't really have to worry <laughs> about all of these other things that are out there, right? So we have to make sure that we stay really balanced um, within our own spirituality, but that there's also things that we all need, that we all do have a call to some sort of service, that we all do have a call to searching for the truth. We all do have a call to seek after beauty. We all do have a call to the sacraments, that we have to stay close to the sacraments. We all have a call to silence. This is a really hard one for me. <laughs> and sometimes when we have a call to those things, when they seem like they're in opposition to what our natural spirituality is. So for somebody who prefers to have ex expressive praise, who prefers um, praise and worship to silence, uh, for me, a lot of times in my life, that means I need more silence. <laughs> and that that's where the Lord is going to be able to have an opportunity to stretch me as well. And so Again, this is a constant discernment and an openness to God calling us at different times in our lives and of being able to say, yes, like this works for me and I, I experience the Lord, I express well in this kind of a way, but God is also calling me and stretching me over here in order for me to be able to come to know him in a deeper way as well. And so, of course, the importance of all of these kind of things is for us to really um, have a 
be able to grow in our relationship with God, but also for us to be able to grow in our vocations. And that our vocation, our primary vocation, is um, a vocation to love, right? So when we find out who it is that God has called us to be, when we find um, the different uh, path that God has called us to be on, then obviously what's going to happen in our life is that we are going to start to rid ourselves of all but love, which is going to therefore spill over into our vocation. It's going to make us a better um, husband, wife, mother, father, um, sister, priest, that of course, when we are doing well spiritually, then we are going to be doing well in the different roles in our life as well. So our spirituality is um, is going to naturally, if we're doing what God is calling us to do, it's going to rid us of all but love, which is the only goal in our whole life, right? Is for us to rid ourselves of all but love so that we can eternally be able to be with the Lord and be in the presence of um, love himself for all of, of um, eternity. So what I would like to do um, is to just spend a little bit of time um, kind of praying through uh, these different um, spirituality types that you have um, in front of you. I don't know if all of you have had a chance to read all the way through them, um, but as, as I've been trying to emphasize, like to let the spirit um, really try to stir within you, to stir within you as you read all four of them to see, okay, this is something that makes me really excited, but how am I uh, fostering this spirituality in my life? Am I actively doing things that is making this spirituality come alive? If it's something that's an intellectual life, are you seeking? Are you seeking truth? Are you intellectually stimulating yourself? Are you putting yourself in situations where you can grow um, in your intellectual life um, in accordance with the Lord? If you feel like it's this path of devotion, are you putting yourself in situations where your heart can be moved? Are you in the chapel? Are you in, um, are you in entering into community and into things like that where your heart can come alive. So to ask yourself that question, but then also kind of be looking for, okay, here's like an area where I feel, I feel like God is calling me out of my comfort zone a little bit. So I just want to give the spirit some some room um, and some movement um, in this room. And then uh, what we'll do after that is take a little bit of time for discussion to kind of um, help unpack like what's working for some people um, and what the challenges are for other people. So let's start though um, with some prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Lord, again, um, you come and you tell us that uh, we are one body, um, but we have many parts and that these parts are specific calls that you have given us and that there will be people in our lives that will not know who you are unless we bring you to them. And there will be people in our lives who have their doors of their heart are closed, but that there will be an opportunity where that door is open and that you are calling us specifically to bring you to that person's life. That as St. Francis says, that there are some people who their only sermon that they will hear in their lifetime is the lives of the people who are in this room. Lord, we know that us being who you called us to be is vital. It's vital to our own spirituality, our relationship with you, but it could be vital to other people's salvation as well. And so we invite your Holy Spirit to come into our hearts to stretch them, to stretch them into the way that you want to encounter us, not today, but in, as we leave this conference, in this practical things that need to be put in place so that we can come to know you deeper and better. As you say in the scripture, all of the parts do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. And since we have the gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them. So what I'd like to do is just give you some time to pray over um, this handout that you have, to invite the Spirit to speak.
So what I'd like to do now, um, this is a very like workshoppy kind of thing to do, um, rather than me just talking, um, is to give you an opportunity um, to talk with one another uh, about um, what really works for you, what challenges you've experienced um, within uh, a certain type of uh, prayer, a certain type of spirituality. Uh, because I think sometimes that that can be the most fruitful, rather than like me standing here and saying, this is the books that you should read and whatever for each <laughs> different type of spirituality, this is what you should do when it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody in the room, but also um, to be able to speak from experience uh, and to hear from experience from um, one another. And so um, what I'd like to do is we're gonna break out um, into four different sections of the room, um, one for each of the different types of spirituality. And if you just want to grab um, two or three people uh, that share in that same type of spirituality with you, and you can have a seat somewhere, you can leave this room if you want to and go somewhere else, um, but just sort of have a small group experience um, and to add, answer three questions. So the first is um, just basically what jumped out to you um, during this workshop, workshop session, something that stood out to you. Um, the second is, uh, what is you see as your biggest challenge, um, being able to grow within this um, spirituality? Um, and then lastly, what has really worked for you? What has been um, different practices, different types of prayers, different things that you've read, uh, resources? What have been things that have been really helpful to you in being able to grow um, in your spirituality? So um, we will do uh, the path of intellect um, when we over in this corner, um, the path of devotion in that back corner by the door. Um, the path of service will be over kind of by the stairs, and the path of asceticism will be um, right over here. So um, if you want to go ahead and, and if, if you didn't fit 100% into one of those groups, just kind of uh, which one you felt most drawn to, and then maybe within discussion you will also be able to kind of um, discern uh, where you can better try to grow in that area as well.